Rethinking the Oriental Carpet and Early Renaissance Paintings. In this series of seven lectures, we're going to step away from conventional wisdom and rethink the role of the Oriental Carpet in Early Renaissance Paintings. Instead of interpreting them as luxury items of Muslim manufacture, new research from the online Carpet Index establishes the presence of non-Muslim carpets of Armenian, Greek, Georgian, and Syrian origin in European religious paintings before the year 1500. This is exciting news because as such, these carpets can now be understood not as trade items, but as venerated relics. We can now see them as demographic markers indicators of the movement of Eastern Christians westward into Europe in advance of the Sunni warriors that came to dominate their ancestral lands in Asia Minor. And as such, these paintings with oriental carpets can be seen as a whole new window onto the emerging Renaissance. So let's begin. This introduction starts and ends, as all good stories do, in Florence, Italy. The year was 1439. The Council of Florence brought together Eastern and Western Christians in a historic attempt at church unity. This was in the face of the threat of the Ottoman Turks, who were making militant incursions into Asia Minor. The thousands of delegates came at the invitation of Pope Eugenius IV, and it was a virtual who's who of the early Renaissance. John VIII Paleologus, Emperor of Byzantium, attended and brought with him his most learned theologians, including Mark of Ephesus and Basilius Bessarion, of whom we'll hear a lot more later. The Duke of Burgundy sent his representatives, and famous clergy, who later became saints of the Roman Catholic Church, attended as well, including the Franciscan Bernardino of Siena and the Dominican Antoninus of Florence. The meetings took place in Santa Maria Novella, home church of the hosts of the conference, the Dominicans of Florence, and it was large enough to host the thousands of clergy from around the known world who attended. These included many delegations of Copts, Syriac, and Armenian clergy. Like all good guests, the attendees brought gifts, primarily sacred manuscripts from Armenian, Greek, Syriac, Maronite and Coptic monasteries, which became the foundations of the Vatican Library in Rome. So there was great jubilation in July 1439 when the decree of union was declared at last. Church unity was achieved. Or not. Looking back, historians have considered the Council of Florence to be a failure, but in fact it had considerable impact on the art and culture of the emerging Renaissance. My research suggests, in fact, that the Council spawned a whole new genre of painting, the Sacra Conversazione, or Sacred Conversation, where Mother Church appears to be surrounded by her gently conversing saints. The very first Sacra Conversazione was painted during the Council by Fra Angelico for his Dominican brothers at the convent of San Marco, and interestingly enough, it included an oriental carpet. I became fascinated by this carpet in this early Sacra Conversazione. Why was the carpet there? Because I had been taught in graduate school that a carpet in a painting was a status symbol and luxury item of Muslim manufacture, and yet there was nothing even remotely luxurious about this carpet. It wasn't of luminous silk pile. Instead, it appeared to be a rude flat weave made of rustic wool, covered with folkloric animal motifs. This incongruity between what I was taught and what I was seeing puzzled me. I was perplexed enough to go back and take another look at the traditional scholarship on Oriental carpets and early Renaissance paintings. And here are some quotes from traditional sources. On the puzzling appearance of the rustic flat weave, I quote, altogether the painting suggests that these carpets were utilitarian objects of little intrinsic artistic interest. They denote instead an honored or luxurious space. Their frequency in Tuscan annunciations, several with very similar and uncommonly visible animal designs, 
suggests a common iconographical source. On the geometric pile carpets found in Flemish paintings, the commentary goes like this. Western fascination with oriental carpets dates from the 15th century, when European painters began to celebrate the artistry of pile carpets imported from the Islamic world. The Netherlandish artist Jan van Eyck was the first to emphasize the beauty of exotic carpets, but his descriptions of them are unreliable. And another comment from a different author, one has to consider that probably the most popular and widespread types of carpets were portrayed in paintings. Either these were preferred by the importers, or perhaps the artists themselves simplified a complex pattern. On Italian painters such as Pintoriccio, quote, the representation of carpets enabled artists to showcase their descriptive skills. New Italian attitudes toward domestic furnishings must have been the foremost among the factors that propelled the carpet into a display object and status symbol. So there you have the scholarship in a nutshell. Let me sum it up for you. Even though these carpets under the feet of the Virgin were utilitarian objects of little artistic interest, nevertheless, they celebrated the artistry of carpets imported from the Islamic world. While their depictions in these paintings were often unreliable, yet nevertheless, they enabled artists to showcase their descriptive skills. In all, they illustrate a new Italian attitude towards domestic furnishings. Frankly, I wasn't satisfied with this scholarship. There were serious problems with these interpretations. One of the supreme rules of art history in this period is that every detail in paintings like this was loaded with symbolic meaning, from the variety of trees behind the Madonna to the blue color of her cloak, which symbolizes purity. And yet, I'm supposed to toss off this carpet as, at best, an expensive status symbol, even when it's like a runway right up to the Madonna. It just didn't make sense to me. But there were more serious problems with the traditional interpretation. How can we have it both ways? Carpets are utilitarian and luxury items. Typically, those are exclusionary categories. And oddly enough, for over 225 years, the same utilitarian carpet repeats itself in Florentine paintings. Why is that? So here's the conundrum of the carpet before 1500. Even if we ignore the so-called utilitarian carpets until later, we still have a problem with the traditional notion of luxury item of Muslim manufacture. For instance, why is a Muslim luxury item included under the feet of saints dedicated to poverty, such as the Franciscan San Bernardino? For that matter, why should a Muslim luxury item even be included in almost 400 European religious paintings? I felt that what was needed was a whole fresh new look at carpets and paintings before 1500. I began with formulating the carpet index with new online data, open scholarship, and fresh theories on carpets and early Renaissance paintings with a chronological listing of all paintings with oriental carpets the core I was interested in was before 1500. And each photo, incidentally, can be clicked on for further details. I was interested in exploring two things. First, I was curious to know if there was a pattern or theme as to when the carpets appeared. Typically, when we look at a painting such as this by the Venetian Lorenzo Lotto, we concentrate on the so-called Lotto carpet and its inclusion is usually explained as a luxurious studio prop. But I was interested in finding out whether the carpet itself played a further role. Did the context or theme of the painting, which here is St. Antoninus giving charity, did that have any relation to the inclusion of the carpet? In addition, given my training, I expected to find many luxurious domestic interiors in this early group. And I was curious as to where these luxury items would appear to enhance the status of the painting. I was in for two major surprises. In all, the index falls into only a very few specific categories, but 
The first surprise was that almost 66% of the index, fully two-thirds of it, is devoted to the Madonna. And these paintings include some of the most sublimely beautiful works of the early Renaissance. And so I put together a small collection here for you to enjoy. Certainly, we are in the precinct of the Virgin, where in every instance the carpet is not simply a marker of luxury. Instead, it marks the holy ground of Mother Church. The second surprise came more slowly. I struggled with a peculiar group of seemingly unrelated paintings, almost 20% of the carpet index, Initially, they fit into no other context or category. Why so many marriages? And what about a baptism with a carpet? And the large number of funeral paintings? And what are the many images of charitable giving? Why did these include a carpet? So here was the second surprise. I finally realized that I was looking at a group. That odd mixed up part of the carpet index was actually representations of the seven sacraments of the early Renaissance church. Here we're looking at the sacrament of marriage, where in addition to the little dog of fidelity, we have both the removed shoes and the carpet signifying holy ground. The seven sacraments of the early Renaissance church are the rituals that you, as a Christian, must do to remain in good standing with the church. You must participate in baptism of your children, confirmation of your youth, ordination if you're called to the priesthood, receiving the Eucharist or going to Mass, and at that time people sometimes did that once a day, the giving of charity, the sacrament of marriage, and finally, last rites and Christian burial. We have many early Renaissance paintings of these sacramental activities where the carpet continues to mark holy ground of Mother Church. And I'll show each one of them to you. Baptism, confirmation and ordination, the sacrament of Mass, the giving of charity, which is sometimes called penance, the sacrament of marriage, last rites and Christian burial. In all, the carpet index confirms the sacramental role of carpets in European paintings. So, if the carpet signifies the holy ground of Mother Church and has sacramental meaning, how can it be of Muslim manufacture? It isn't. This is where we need to seriously rethink the role of the carpet as to what we are actually seeing, because we are seeing Christian carpets in Europe before 1500, not luxury items of Muslim manufacture. The theory of the Christian carpet was first proposed by the German scholar Volkmar Ganshorn in the 1980s. His work has been very controversial in carpet studies for the past 30 years, as he suggested that the craft of Middle Eastern carpet weaving was not exclusively a Muslim craft, that Armenians and other Christians 
participated in and contributed significantly to the craft in the East. The carpet index gives new statistical hep and depth to many parts of Volkmar Ganshorn's controversial theory of the Christian carpet. And from here on in, we'll be looking at these as Christian carpets and interpreting a new pathway to the West for them. Where in the past, conventional wisdom has treated, has treated these carpets as commercial luxury items of Muslim manufacture, we will introduce a new and radical new concept for us to think over. That these carpets can be seen as markers of a demographic shift of Eastern Christians coming to the West in the early modern era. And here's how that came about. The Third and Fourth Crusades set off a pattern of collateral damage and migration. Between 1204 and 1475, several small waves of Eastern Christians fled to the West. Around 1291, the situation in the Holy Land had become desperate. With the fall of Accra in 1291, many Eastern Christians who had supported the Crusaders' cause, and these were Armenians, Greeks, Georgians, and Syrians, were desperate to leave Asia Minor and come west. They did not flee or resettle without help. Franciscan and Dominican missionaries before 1400 had traveled and lived among the Eastern Christians in their ancestral lands and had formed strong bonds with them. And here is another interpretation, that the Dominicans and Franciscans, who were building large churches in Italy at the time, sympathized with the Armenian craftsmen who were losing their livelihood as Turkey and the Holy Land fell under Sunni Muslim rule. Around 1300, these same Dominicans and Franciscans helped whole families and workshops of skilled Christian craftsmen, which included goldsmiths and painters, illuminators and makers of exquisite Christian liturgical objects, helped them leave the Armenian kingdom of Cilicia in what is now Turkey and resettle in Tuscany along the pilgrimage roads to Rome. Once in Tuscany, the precious relic carpets that the Armenians brought with them were preserved, copied, and venerated in church treasuries for centuries. We see this particularly in Florence, where one singular dragon carpet is repeatedly copied at least nine times from 1250 until 1474, over a span of almost 225 years. While in Siena and its surrounding countryside, another different carpet with a tree of life motif is copied an astonishing number of times, at least 18 and counting at this point, from the year 1300 until 1462 a little more than 150 years. In the north after 1430, a similar but smaller migration of Christian merchant families from the Black Sea area around Trebizond, possibly Armenian, but more likely Georgian, were helped to resettle in Burgundian Flanders by agents of Philip the Good. We can mark this small demographic shift by looking at the visual record of another repeating relic carpet in Flanders. These appear at least five times in paintings in Bruges, first in 1436 and last seen in the visual record in 1528, almost a hundred years later. In a different instance, Greek scholars arrived in Renaissance Italy in droves around 1453, as Constantinople fell to Mehmet II. This is where we suddenly see the entrance into the visual record of vast quantities of so-called small pattern Holbein carpets, which were Greek-made carpets from Ottoman-occupied Turkey that began hiding in plain sight in early Renaissance paintings around 1450, finally disappearing from the visual record around 1600. I wouldn't call these small pattern Holbein carpets relic carpets per se, but I suggest that they were purchased in large numbers by Italian humanists, which signified their financial and emotional support for Greeks coming west, and also for the carpet makers remaining under Ottoman rule in Asia Minor. 
A small pattern Holbeins appear in many depictions of humanist meetings, such as here, the Council of Mantua of 1459, where European military intervention with the Ottomans was proposed. These carpets signified support for the Greeks. To sum up the carpet index, the golden age of the Christian carpet was before 1500, when it had symbolic and sacramental meaning in the early Renaissance. During that period, we were clearly in the precinct of the Virgin, and the Eastern carpet marked the holy ground of Mother Church that united East and West. Before 1500, carpets entered the West as objects of Christian veneration, not as commercial luxury items of Muslim manufacture. O oh, brave new world! The Reformation changed forever the religious symbolism of the carpet. Accusations of Mariolatry, or worship of the Virgin, made Latin Christians wary of depicting Mother Church. In the Roman Catholic reaction to the Reformation, the adult masculine Christ appears as the head of his church, now emphasized by the white altar-like cloth placed over the carpet's holy ground. O oh, brave new world indeed! Reformation England was the last holdout on the religious symbolism of the carpet as holy ground of Mother Church, and not in a good way. If you take nothing else away from this introduction to rethinking the Oriental carpet and early Renaissance paintings, I hope you'll look at this image of Henry VIII astride the carpet in a fresh new way. He has thrown Mother Church off her carpet, and there's no question that he is standing on the holy ground as the head of his new reformed Church of England. And here's his little son Edward, manfully imitating his father's no girls allowed stance. He too is the head of the new church. After 1520, we are truly in a new world, a man's world. The beautiful mothers and infants on the carpet have been eclipsed by the age of discovery. Clearly, we're no longer in the precinct of the Virgin. Her carpet is now heaped with the masculine tools of science and empire. After 1520, the golden age of the Muslim carpet coincides with the Reformation, when carpets entered the West as commercial luxury items from Ottoman Turkey and Safavid Persia. Yet, even as Muslim produced carpets largely replaced Christian produced carpets after 1520, the carpet itself still retained the traditional sacramental meaning of holy ground. As we've seen, here the luxurious pile carpet is overlaid by a white altar-like cloth with Christ himself as the Eucharist. And its sacramental symbolism persisted in the tense atmosphere of Roman Catholic versus Calvinist during the Dutch Golden Age, when the same combination of sacramental white cloth over the table carpet takes on subtle, judgmental overtones of sacrilege when it appears in boisterous, drunken genre paintings. The Carpet Index. As an art historian, I'm offering three new ideas to explore within this series of seven lectures. The first will be the concept of the relic carpet in Renaissance art. These were not luxury items traded between religious rivals but venerated Christian objects brought to the West and preserved. The second concept of the sacramental role of the carpet as holy ground is possibly the most important as it continues today in contemporary Italy and elsewhere in the Christian world. And third, the concept of carpets as demographic markers of Eastern Christians resettling in the West Look again at the multitude of Renaissance paintings with multi-generational families gathered around the Oriental carpet. I suggest that we're seeing Eastern family ties. In fact, a DNA study from 2005 indicates that up to 10% of Italian males have the unusual G, or Caucasian marker, on their Y chromosome, probably indicating Eastern Christian paternity at some point in the past.
When we reclaim carpets as demographic markers, they give us a whole new window onto the Renaissance. I hope you'll join me for segment two where we introduce the relic carpets of Tuscany.